Alrighty. <laughs> Good day, all my gays, gals, and non-binary pals. You're listening to NBS Radio. In today's episode, I will be speaking with our current Minister of Defense, Icarus. Welcome to the show. Hi. I'm As we'll come to learn, Icarus has been on Nation States for about three years to this point and has mainly spent her time in the user-created regions of Care CD and our allies, Europia, before joining the North Pacific. In this interview, we'll learn about each of the stages in her career leading up to this point and discuss her plans going forward here in the North Pacific. So let's get right into it. Because I'm a very sequential, one-track sort of person, it always makes sense at the beginning. So let's start with the Social Technocratic Union. That was your first region, right? Yes, it was. What made you interested in that region? Why were you there? Um, and how long were you there? I was, well, it wasn't so much the region I was interested in. It was the people because I was dragged into NS um, like mid first lockdown by one of my school friends who was like, there's this really cool nation simulator and it doesn't require strategy, which as Fiji knows is not kind, kind of not my thing. Um, and you're getting there i'm getting there <laughs> and um you know you, i discovered discord like roughly three months before i joined ns and or two months and i was having fun you know just hanging out with people and my friend was like yeah you can meet all of these really cool awesome people there so i joined essentially for the voice chats <laughs> And your your NS joining story is like the reverse of what most people experience, right? <laughs> most people, if they they Google some like nation poli political simulator online and then find it that way. But yours was like, oh, you were on Discord before nation states. But I was right. on, yeah well, yeah I was on Discord to hang out with my theater friends for, because we weren't able to see each other, and they were like you know kind of my family. And we were just talking to each other like every single day for three months straight. Like Discord was. You need to make sense. You get it. To do that, yeah. It's the pandemic, so yeah. Yep. So, what made you later decide to join KRCD from the STU? Do you want to take a guess? <laughs> this is going to be a reoccurring <laughs> theme, but it's the people. Um. All right. I, I mean, it's good. What what specifically like uh, I know there was uh, like Lawler was in in Care CD. Yeah. Was it like mentorship that brought brought you there? Was it just sort of the friends you made along the way? It started like with the voice chats that we had in the STU, kind of migrating to Care CD because they had a bigger gaming community. So the friend who dragged me in kind of migrated there mostly, and then other people did too. And at one, at some point, I was like, okay, I'm going to check out this place, too. And I got there, and the people were awesome. And I got to meet many, many wonderful folks, like like Lawler, that you mentioned, who is one of my first NS mentors. And then um, also Captain Carrot, who is one of the regions. Monarch, right? Yeah, and, and Ayu as well, who's who's the seasonal queen care cd and the founder she's she's really really cool so i guess for people who don't know care cd is like this gaelic themed region right so everything is is about like welsh scottish and irish culture and all the names of the various positions and the lore in the region is themed in that sort of way right yeah the biggest discussion we always had was how to pronounce like the fucking ministries that we had because no nobody knew like how to uh, pronounce Tanish Tay or Tishuk or whatever like I've that. gotten there I've practiced yeah I did my research <laughs> nice <laughs> um, yeah it was it so, was so how was how was Care CD structured then what what was the Tishuk what is the Tanista? What are the various ministerial positions, at least when you were there 
I know that it has probably subsequently changed. It it has changed since I left, yeah. Um, it was, back then, it was the Taoiseach. Well, there was the monarchy, but the monarchy was more of an, like, a representative power, in a way. Like, they Good. did they did hold, like, in the end, they did hold all of the strings, but the actual, like, executive work was done by the Taoiseach um, and their cabinet. The Taoiseach, you know, you can imagine kind of like the president of Europea, just in a much smaller role, obviously, because Care City is a lot smaller than Euro is. Um, and then you had the Tanishte, which is sort of like a vice president, a second in command um, type of deal. And you had the Ministry of Communications, Foreign Affairs, and... Um, the Ministry of Culture, and those were the various ministry positions there elected, or were they appointed by the Tishik? They were all appointed by the Tishik, and the Tishik was elected. That's what, yeah, Got it. yeah. So, after arriving in Care uh, CD, um, I read that you became Minister of Foreign Affairs, and three times was elected Taoiseach. How did that all go down? Um, so... I mean, there's a lot of history there. Yes. But to be fair, I was still very, very new to NS at that point, so I had very little idea of what was actually going on. Um, I was very much in my learning phase. And so, like, I think two or three months after I joined Cure CD my friend who dragged me into nation states, you know, became Tishik and therefore had to appoint his government. And he was like, hmm, I think you'd make a good minister of culture. And I was like, Are you sure about that? And he was like, yeah. So I did it. And um, then he didn't run for re-election. And Lawler was one of the people who, like, heavily encouraged me to, you know, try running for Tishik myself. And I was having a lot of fun, you know, organizing things for people in my position as culture minister. So I was like, you know, I can do that in a, like, larger scale and more the way that I want it if, like, to do it if I become Tishik. So I ran for Tishik and I was elected. Um, I didn't really have a big competition, to be fair. So it wasn't exactly hard. I, um, yeah, I I was Tishik and then was re-elected directly after that. So essentially, from the moment that I became culture minister for the first time, I spent one and a half consecutive years in Kira City's executive government in every single position except for communications. Um because I'm not very good at writing articles. Y yeah, that's that's how that so happened. So during that time, uh, I, I feel like you uh, you did a lot with foreign affairs in, in Kara CD, specifically by establishing a relationship with Europea, which you would later then go on to join. What was the, the process like of establishing that sort of interregional bond and what led up to signing that treaty? Um, you see, the, that's actually like the kind of thing that um, I was the least involved in, in all of like the things that I did in CS because I kind of took over when the treaty, like I came into power when the treaty was essentially done with being negotiated. Um, so... Okay, so you signed it, but you didn't I negotiate. I signed it. I didn't negotiate it. But afterwards, we had events. I think we had a region of the week thing with Euro, and we um, did radio shows together, and we just, like, culturally became relatively close, which was something that right. I... Right. Yeah. I wasn't... I wasn't aware how to do foreign affairs back then for the record i was i was vibing i think we were talking about um 
your sort of learning experience in Care CD, uh, specifically um, how a lot of the foreign affairs with the the treaty with uh, Europea was already taken care of by the time you signed mm-hmm. uh, signed it. But um, following that, there was uh, a lot of games and interregional activities with Europea that sort of brought the two regions together. Yep. Right. Yes. And yeah, yeah, obviously leading up to that as well, uh, cultural events that happened, um, I think, which is how, if it was, yeah. If it was the, the people that make you so interested in a region, mm-hmm. was it the people who then brought you over to Europe? Yep. So I joined Euro f- to do a radio show after our treaty was signed with the wonderful and awesome and very lovely Pictonia, who I think was maybe president back then, or who became president shortly after at least. And I was just kind of vibing, you know, because I felt really bad the first time I got a second citizenship. I was like, oh my god, I'm betraying the SDU. Am I even allowed to have two nations? Because, you know, I was I was very new to the game. Um, And I was like, you know, two citizenships is enough. I'm not getting another one. Um, And so I was just kind of vibing in Euro for a long, long time. Relatively speaking, at least, you know, to be active in a a region and then to not actually have citizenship. I was, I was, I joined in November. I didn't get citizenship until February of the next year. Um, even though I was essentially in Euro on a daily basis, but at some point I was just like, I might as well. But my main focus was still very much in, in Cure City because, you know, that was like very much still at the beginning of me doing things there. Um, yeah, it was sort of a more gradual shift then. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very much that. So... In Care CD, I read that you did two separate, like, very small military operations. But they were, like, very basic, like, single target uh, operations. What sort of encouraged you to start doing military on NS that early? Um, Lawler. Because he was in charge of the autumnal court which is Kirisidi's military and he popped into my dms one day and was like do you want to join the military and i was like sure and then i did and i managed you know like i mentioned i was very noobish back then so i managed to multi and get myself wa band um (laughs) for a year which the I... unfortunate consequence of those operations. Yeah, uh, it wasn't the operations actually that um those I think those happened afterwards. I don't actually remember them, but I know that I like I texted I texted I didn't text the admins I I sent a GHR explaining like that I was new to this and that I made a big mistake and they were like okay, you're not completely WA banned. You're allowed to have one nation in the WA, but you're not allowed to switch it. So the only thing that I was able to do, you know, was one target operations. Um, Got it. Yeah. But that but then that kind of sparked, um, you know, this obsession with this thing that I couldn't have, but that I wanted to do. Um obsession is the wrong word but it like it created the need for me to you know do r&d you always want what you can't have yes exactly so i was very very you know infatuated with the idea of doing r&d um and i i like i even created like a hundred puppets at some point because i was I was like, I need these for when I for when I can finally switch, and um, even though I was like half a year away from being unbanned, um, and is that the uh, the flat flat boom series? Yes, that's the flat flat boom series. The first one hundred were 
are way older than the other ones. Um, and so at some point that uh, that WA ban lapsed, right? And you were in Europe, yeah. yeah. And as far as I can tell, after uh, gaining citizenship, very early on, you joined the radio ministry there, followed by I think culture and uh, foreign affairs. Yep. Uh, but then also the European Royal Navy or ERN in August of 2021. Yep. So what were your early experiences in the ERN like? Noting that like Care City may have been your, your first military NS experience, but you were still so new in the game then and you got WA banned. So the, the ERN was really the sort of the start of your R&D career. What was the, the learning curve like? So the ERN was pretty much dead at in the water at that point but but yeah it's the republican not the royal neighbor neighbor. glad you've corrected me all right so it wasn't very active at that point very active but but i had a stillion and a stillion is notably very very awesome so you should all vote for his command once it comes around not only because i'm in oh absolutely i know about a stillion on my own terms yes um Estillian was not Grand Admiral at that t- at that point, but he was still in command. Um, and him and I, he's we he's one of my oldest NS friends. Um, also one of one of the mentors, one of the biggest ones, probably the biggest one. Um, and he was like, "Okay, I'm taking you tagging." And you know, because there weren't a lot of people around, um, was, I think it was like a ten puppet operation so not that many but i i hadn't ever done any of the switching stuff just like i was on on boom beach and uh, i did genua and genua those are like the two only operations i ever I, I think i was properly on um i'm completely unfamiliar with those um i think uh, genua was an anti-fascist right that was like I think the biggest jump in NS history, or like the, at that point it was. I think it may have been broken by one of the liberation attempts uh, in like early twenty twenty two. But correct me if I'm wrong on that. Anyone in chat? I wouldn't know. Um. And. But that's a very very notable operation to start out with. I was I was the seventh to jump into the region, and there were over a hundred people in that operation. I felt very proud of myself. Were you using the uh, the unreliable laptop to do it, or was it a different device? Oh no, it was the unreliable laptop. I'm pretty sure. Um, Excellent. I think it may have been my old laptop at that point. So essentially, back to the first operation I did with the RN. Um, ST just kind of threw me into the cold water because I had to point and jump and switch at the same time. Um, I had I had no idea of the concept of pointing mind you or anything really um so i i had to figure that all out but thankfully estillian is very good at explaining things so um we did that and then there was a lot of nothing that happened because the rn you know was dead in the water until i think in december of that year estillian told me how to like taught me how to trigger which then meant I could lead my own operations, which I promptly started yeah. doing. And that's what I, you know, continued to do. So you developed your skill from Estillian and you had to learn the ropes as you went because the best way to learn is by doing. Yep. And that's where you built the experience that has pushed your whole career forward, basically. Yep. But then in your role, uh, what was your, your first ministerial position? Because you were active in the other ministries as well. Yes, I was. My first ministerial position was as Minister of Radio, actually. Um, because that was still one of my very big main focuses and still is. I love the Ministry of Radio. I love doing radio, so I'm having a good good time here. Um, as a former minister of radio in the North Pacific myself, I've got like so much 
pent up curiosity about your time in the same role in Euro, especially since EBC radio is like such an inspiration and frankly continues to be an inspiration and aspiration for NBS radio. So like, I'm like bubbling over with like all sorts of questions about it that I don't know that everyone is interested in, but I figure I'll just jump, jump into it anyway. Like Do it. how does the ministry of radio in Euro even operate? Like, do you have a lot of staff working for you? Um, how are shows created? Like, how does that work? What's the process like? So EBC radio has changed a bit over the last year, but it used to be just like, you know, there were certain shows that would always happen during a term, like executive satisfaction and Senate satisfaction poll discussions and, you know, just discussions about poly Euro politics. And then there would be the more funzy or like out of character shows where people would just go like, hmm, I think doing a show about this might be fun. Um, like there was the Brits cast, which was Wim and Sicrio just talking about British politics, and Estillian and I um, have this series called Talking Tales, where we just read um, stories, like bedtime stories and things like that. That's like one of my favorite things to do, and we really have to do it again. Um, and it's just like people yes there is a lot of stuff and there used to be more but like every region euro is affected by um activity decline which made like you know especially activity in radio a lot harder um so say we all yes i think uh, tnt has faced many of the same problems there yeah um but, are shows like typically performed live for an audience, or are they yes. like hosted later? Um, well, with the switch to Spotify, which happened during my second radio term, um, we got the ability to do, um, you know, non-live shows as well, which right. you know has helped give people safer spaces and also have more sensitive FA shows where, you know, things might have to be cut for security reasons, etc. <laughs> um, International incident avoidance, yes. right. Uh, do you do a lot of editing on those shows typically, or is that really only reserved for the more sensitive topics? Um, so when we were still on Mixler, we did zero editing. Um, yeah, it was just that's appealing. <laughs> yeah, it was just you hit the button, Mixler puts you in life on Mixler, and then you know, you you just what come comes. What right. comes comes. Yep. There's no way to edit it or upload it anyway else. Um, it's just it just is, and then with switching to the recording stuff that we have now things got a little more advanced um which you know in the beginning required m like particularly me doing a lot of the editing and i'm a perfectionist which is not very good when you're editing things oh i'm like, i'm aware of that yeah an hour long or something sometimes longer when you say you're a perfectionist, though, like, what do, you, what do you mean by that? Like, were you trying to remove background noise or were you, like, editing particular language, like, removing pauses or ums or things like that to make people sound smarter? Like, you, you might laugh, but I legitimately have done that before. Yes. No, 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 no. I have to. Pauses, ums, um, typing, because, you know, Zencaster, Caster, which is the recording thing we use now um allows you to have multi-track recording so you can just mute people essentially wow. which That's is so much better <laughs> it's very very cool but it's also only works when you have a desktop so it's a little bit inaccessible which has proven itself to be a little bit of an issue at times but uh is mostly fine so the reason you made the, the switch from mixer then to anchor right was because Mixor started becoming like a, a paid service, right? It always had been, and it always will be, because Euro is still very much paying for it. 
because otherwise all of the shows would be lost and there's like several thousand shows you know stored on mixed maybe it was um, not paid for why did you select anchor as the as new uh platform like what were they just was that a decision that you made or was it sort of by others um like previous radio ministers no i had my first well it was half a term that i had at first as radio minister because picto got promoted to vice president after that one had to step down i think that's how that went and so i took over midterm and one of the things they said they were gonna do was create this radio committee to look into alternatives for Mixler. Just that nobody had actually done it until, you know, I started um, having the job. So I created the radio um, tech committee, which was essentially a bunch of experienced radio people looking for alternatives and researching into alternatives to Mixler. And then I wasn't radio minister for a term. The committee entirely, like, completely died. Nobody did anything with the results that we got. And... Oh, no. Yeah. Then they made me radio minister again. And at that point, Pete Trey um, had come back. And he... We had actually ruled out Spotify as an option because we thought it wasn't going to be accessible enough. And he started doing more research into that, consulting Wim, who, you know, is one of the very big radio people outside of Euro. And that's what TWP um, had been using and what, you know, he had found as the best solution. So we got into talks there and at some point we realized that, you know, Anchor and Zencaster were very much the best options to do, you know, the transition away from Mixler. And that's, that's how we ended up there. It was a collective de decision, you know, that came through, oh, so very, very, very many discussions. The reason I was asking is because the North Pacific is in that sort of same ballpark where, mm -hmm. you know, nobody really really knows how to you know do obs video shows properly right yeah. and uh, training people in that is really difficult and editing that is difficult and time consuming and like wouldn't it just be simpler if you know we just did podcasts and so it's like i mean that's what we're doing anyway maybe spotify is the way to go maybe anchor's the way to go so like i i kind of feel like culture and nbs might go down this sort of similar path who knows well if you ever want help with figuring the tech stuff out i wrote <laughs> all of the guides for euro so i i i know it all <laughs> oh excellent all right yeah. um so you mentioned before that there were like various like show series that would happen uh, as as part of EBC Radio, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the the storytelling. What was it? Talking uh, tales. Talking tales, right? Yep. Um, at what point did you come up with uh, Project Moira, and what motivated you to make that series? Frustration. <laughs> so, for people who don't know, tell us what it is. Project Moira was. A project that Estillian and I, yes, Estillian, it, it's a reoccurring theme. Um, Estillian and I did, I think, at the end of 2021, the beginning of 2022, before I became radio minister. Oh, sorry, going out of order here. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. Just so people have the the time context, and um, Euro was. You know, I I was I had been active in Euro for roughly a year at that point. I was a culture deputy and planned a lot of the culture things for almost a year. And it was very hard for me to kind of feel seen in what I did. 
And I was like, I was talking to Esti about it, being like, what am I doing wrong? You know, what, what's so different about me that I'm doing wrong? And we came, like, we we were talking about this, and I was like, I feel like sometimes it's different because I'm a girl. And he was like, yeah, I think that might actually have something to do with it. Which is not to say that, you know, Euro is this, this horribly you know, an accessible place for women, which, because it very much is not. Um, there are very many wonderful women and non-binary people in Euro, and um, there have been historically. But Euro at that point, I think, had no women in cabinet and hadn't had any women in cabinet for quite some time. And it was just, it was very hard to you know talk about these things because I mentioned them being like you know we don't really like there were I think there were three women slash girls in Euro in total at that point out of like I mean, 60 um, citizens barely, barely similar to the North Pacific um yeah but it was very lonely in a way because you didn't really have anyone to, to confide in about these things that you you know subconsciously knew were happening but you d you kind of felt crazy um for it because there was nobody to relate to um and so isti who is like has a background in this kind of thing was like you know there there this is actually a fairly common occurrence and i was like you know what isti we should make a project about this what if we, you know, interview w women in NS about their experiences of, you know, being a woman in NS? Because I've read about the symposium that Mouse Bumples did at some point, and I felt very inspired by that. And I was like, I think this is still relevant now. We should, do you think this would be a good idea? And Estillian was completely on board with it instantly, because Estillian is extremely awesome. Um... And yes, Maui, three three is very, very, very low. And so we started reaching out to, you know, other women and non-binary people in NS um, and had interviews, written interviews that were conducted by Stillian and then ra I think two radio interviews that were conducted by me. And the feedback from those were so amazing because we had so many listeners who like we had we had shows on the IRC and then we had one con conclusionary show with Estillian and me where we just talked about our experiences with the project in UCRCon and I had so many women reach out to me being like oh yes this is I, I relate to all of this and it was it was kind of eye-opening because it kind of you know, you, you realize that you're not alone in these experiences or you feel undervalued or you don't feel seen or heard or you're, the way you play the game isn't the way that you become quote-unquote conventionally successful um, because it takes a different kind of attitude that women are usually usually not like as accustomed to because of social upbringings, etc. And social contexts that we grow up in right and it's it, it was it was it was it was just very nice to have the feedback of so many people coming to my dms being like yes yeah this is exactly i relate to all of what you said or just have these discussions in like an open space and yeah that was it, i think yeah. it still is the most rewarding experience that i've ever had in nation states up until this point i think it's quite valuable so for people who haven't uh gone and taken a listen to it i very much encourage you to do so because i, I would also describe it as as eye-opening and i think i did because there's just a lot of issues that i i wouldn't really think about and it's a whole perspective of the game that um just doesn't get heard that that frequently so anyway I, I'm going to skip way, way forward. There was another radio project, I think, called Project Athena. Mm -hmm. um, 
it kind of makes sense to talk about it in sort of the the radio section of the show, even though it came much much later. So, could you also talk a little bit about what Project Athena was? And um, yeah, Project Athena was fairly recently. It was ended last month, kind of recently. Um, and again, Stillian and me. This time, Isti's idea. He was like. You know how we did Project Marai? What if we did that, but for neurodivergent people? Because both Isti and I are on the, the neurodivergent spectrum. We both have the brain zoomies very badly. And I was like, yes, let's do it. And so we did it. And we had, um, again, Estillian do the um, the written interviews with with people on different kind of kinds of spectrum and all on the neurodivergent side and then me organizing the shows and hosting one of them the one about ADHD that was about as chaotic as you can imagine a show about ADHD made by <laughs> ADHD people <laughs> it happened at 5 a.m or 4 a.m my time because Estillian was on it as well and Estillian's in Australia and then we had a couple of people from the US and then me, the German potato, who sat in the time zone in the middle. So we like got people from like a thirteen hour time difference. I mean that's actually rather impressive. I've had to schedule a lot of radio shows before and yeah. dealing with scheduling is always the hardest part. So honestly, kudos. I'll have to I'll have to listen to that one because I haven't yet. It, all it takes is no respect for your sleep schedule at all. And That's then right. It'll all be fine. <laughs> all right. So, uh, did I miss any other like major radio series that you were a part of? I don't think so. All right. In the meantime, then we'll move on from radio because, well, that was like a huge part of your your role in Europea. It certainly wasn't the only thing that you were doing there. We we already covered the uh, ERN, the Republican name. At what point did you become Grand Admiral there? Um, directly after my second term as radio minister, which I think was in June 2022. But I think towards the end of June 2022, right? So I joined the ERN in August of 2022 was Maui at August of 2021 and was Grand Admiral by June 2022. And I think I very gradually became aware of how actual gameplay politics worked. Like I, I didn't really understand how fucked some of it is to pull it, to put it politely um until i think may of last year so that's when i got really invested you know in actual gameplay politics and that helped me with becoming grand admiral as well you know obviously um and Uh, you mentioned being responsible for ern libcord integration was that something that you did during that time or did that come later um that was i think my first term as grand admiral it was the first term um where we properly integrated into libcord we had had you know operations with libcord before but it wasn't really an official thing and so we kind of restructured the whole thing got rid of the ERN reserves and and um, I think during my second term we created the ERN militia which is an initiative that's kind of unique in its in its existence in nation states I think because essentially everybody who gets European citizenship is part of the militia um it's a channel that exists on the Euro Discord and you get pings for big, big liberations. Um, and you have to specifically like opt out of it to not be a part of the militia. Um, which means that we have an organized way 
to contact our citizens about you know bigger liberations and about ways that they can get involved in the military and in military gameplay which it's a cool way to make it yeah. a, a default that you then have to opt out of yeah uh, that would certainly solve a lot of TNP's um, NPA recruitment problems if everybody was just automatically <laughs> expected to do it. To be fair, um, like people who are part of the ERN militia aren't part of um, like the ERN. It's, it's a separate organization. It's it's, it's mostly just for yes. yeah organizing like bigger bigger. Exactly. Bigger up. You know, because we obviously had saw a lot of very big um raids during twenty twenty two where we had to get essentially every single person possible. And we at some point realized that the best way to do that was to contact people directly and to contact citizens directly, even if they weren't in the ERN. And we had to give that some kind of framework. So we did. <laughs> so, the past, I know that Europea has been quite independent in terms of R&D alignment. And I think that's still true today. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're definitely leaning much more uh, towards defenderism now than I can really ever recall Euro having done. Is, was that like a conscious choice as like the result of the Brotherhood of Malice in, in recent times? Or was it the people changing the the alignment of the region? Um, Euro is still very much independent. It w it's just that Euro was very Vader aligned for a long time. And then the whole BOM shit started happening in a couple of the TBH fuck ups before then that, you know, pushed Euro. It, well, it really started with the embassy raid. That stirred a lot of trouble internally in Euro because Euro participated in. I don't know if you're aware of the embassy raid, um, but Euro participated. For those who are unfamiliar, including uh, myself. Um, <laughs> so. I think this was in 2021, roughly, somewhere at the beginning. It was essentially the embassy, which was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, embassy collecting region. And I think members of Lily managed to gain the trust of the founder. And because it was password protected, so they got the password and they invaded it and then closed all several thousand embassies that the embassy had essentially it was like a very huge act of you know regional destruction in a sense and that's also where euro's anti-griefing policies came from the embassies didn't even actually close for a few days after they were supposed to you know oh, close because it was so many that it fucked the site so bad so like this was a huge scale operation i don't I, I feel sorry for whoever had to close all of those embassies, but Euro was involved in that, and yeah. So it might be illegal, but there is a script that you can use to just auto close them. By the way, yeah, we 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 might updated our anti griefing standards, and people got a lot more weary of raider involvement, and we still like went tagging and everything. Um. But then BOM up happened, you know, and started attacking us and our allies. And that kind of made the whole, you know, TBH and Euro had become estranged before then. But that just drove Euro further towards the defender side. And then Euro started, especially like under the Writing Legend administration, started capping... Um, out all of the raider treaties so um or the more raider leaning treaties and they just went out of the window one after the other and got replaced by treaties with defender regions so euro now has gained treaties with xki tgw um the league classics yes the classics 
and I'm surprised that, and I I know I mentioned this to you the other day about mm-hmm. XKI opening up, but like yeah, I'm very surprised that you as uh, that Euro managed to to get a treaty with them. <laughs> Only after they got their treaty with Boulder, I think. Um, that was really, another surprise. Yeah, that was really the first thing that you know made that um, made that possible. For, for the record, Euro's griefing policies are not legally binding. They're they're guidelines, so you can essentially, as Grand Admiral, decide that you care fuck all and do whatever you want. If you know the president lets you, um, but good to know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's so to know. so we were able to counter eight um, raiders, for example, and grief their shit um, if we if we wanted to um, in the year end. That is not not the NPA, um, but True. with the political shift alignment, obviously came the military shift as well because. You know, the thing with the independent region is you, your military does what's best for your region. And in this case, getting closer to defenderdom is what was best for Euro and is best for Euro. And we hope it stays that way. <laughs> but that's just because I'm a defender. So. Yeah. What point did you decide to run for president of Europea? So... It was like an idea that Isti and I had played with a couple of times because we were always like, it would be fun to run together, right? Because, you know, Isti is the person that I do the most with, like politically in Euro, and who's also a great friend of mine. Um, And we sort of like, it was never planned, but we just always ended up in a team. And so we were like, in the beginning, it was always, you know, we were always thinking about Estillian as president and me as vice president. But then I had my grand admiral terms and Isti was a little bit inactive and also very busy with his real life. So he, we decided we were just going to do it this way around, I think. And this was like the first time that both of us were like, yes, we actually have time and energy to do this. Let's fucking go. And can you give a short summary of the platform that you ran on? Um, Isti and I are both very foreign affairsy people, and so that was a lot of what our platform focused on that and Project Athena because Euro was and is, as I said, still like having a minor activity crisis, um, as is all of nation states, so the main thing was reinvigorating activity right and we figured that a project like project athena would be perfect for that because it gives people a platform and it gives them a way to get involved be it through you know drafting questions conducting interviews or being interviewed or you know editing or um, being on shows which whichever way they wanted to get involved whether they were comfortable with talking on shows or not or being interviewed or not and um then also just continuing with our fa trajectory you know because uh, through my terms as grand admiral i was already had had the necessary context in in that sphere and was very very aware of the foreign affairs things that were going on um which which obviously like helped during my presidency um and that what was... sort of foreign affairs things were going on during your presidency well i don't i don't even remember it's all a blur um we published a statement on recruitment during frontier and stronghold um which was the first and it was a shared UCR agreement um, between, I believe, XKI, TGW, Euro, and uh, the League in Concord. And that was and still is the first actual proper statement on 
what's going to happen with recruitment when FNS comes around. Um, that took a couple of months um, of diplomacy and careful talks. And then obviously, like, the fucking site died um, for a week or something. <laughs> and I we, remember that. Yeah, yeah, we had the NSS Debt Festival during that time, which was actually pretty cool. Um, Sopa, who was my culture minister at that time, kind of came up with that within an hour of <laughs> of the fucking sight dying. He was like, and I, you know, I had the thought as well, and he came into my DMs and was like, what if we do a festival about this? And I was like, yes, do it. And so he just started making threads on the forum, and it was it was great. Um, <laughs> um, so we kept ourselves busy during that time. And um, we obviously also had the liberation of New Westphalia, which was the only the only major successful liberation of all of 2022, which was pretty, pretty cool. Um, then we also repealed Condemn Ever Wandering Souls, which cost me much, 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 much sleep. But, you know, it worked out in the end, so it's totally worth it. <laughs> um, I also contained several minor or major d diplomatic incidents that I totally can't talk about. I'm sorry. No worries. Uh, <laughs> skip right over those. Because, you know, uh, a lot of things happen behind the scenes that people aren't aware of. And... Um, as, a, as a whole, uh, how do you think the term went? Like, how would you, how would you rate it? I think... It was okay. I think it wasn't outstanding, but I, th I, I believe I did the best with what I was given. Um, and I think what went particularly well, and on the flip side of that, like what were some of the bigger challenges that you faced? Well, activity obviously, but also activity is where we kind of had a couple of major glow-ups because the WA um, Affairs Ministry was uh, essentially dead in the water before my term and I got PA to get back to doing his job there and suddenly we went from one person writing IFVs to 12 people writing IFVs. That was, that was kind of awesome. Yeah, I didn't exactly have an easy job because I was a first-time president after freaking writing legend who's you know the goat so i was i i had very very high standard standards to live up to um which didn't make it easier but i had um him in my cabinet as my fa minister which was very cool because guy is awesome my entire cabinet was awesome for the record they just did the most we i'm, I'm very very happy that I got to work with the people that I got to work with because they um like they took a shitty situation and they actually turned it into something really good like each and every one of them um which which I'm very b proud of that they did that and you know that euro gives people the opportunity to do that is also pretty pretty awesome um like we uh yeah yeah go. sorry no no you can <laughs> you can go ahead i don't want to interrupt i you were in the middle of something um being president wasn't easy for me because i faced backlash for things that i had no control over or things that i like specifically like you know for example, we talked about the Iran militia, right? Um, yeah. That I implemented during my term as Grand Admiral. And, you know, I was like, maybe people have concerns about the whole being conscripted as soon as you become a citizen, right? Thing. And I made a Grand Hall threat. The Grand Hall is like our political discussion center for anyone unaware. And... Uh, like bumped it several times being like you know if anybody has any concerns about this or thinks this is a bad idea 
please voice your concerns now. N nobody voiced any concerns. Um, and then, like two months later, when I'm president, suddenly people start having concerns. It's that a very typical <laughs> phenomenon in nation states. It is. I'm yeah. totally guilty of this myself, by the way. I'm sure ComFed can remember my time on the Security Council. There were many, many occasions where, like, the SC really needed to speak up on something and just totally didn't, like, for months, you know? And then finally, yeah. it's like, well, actually, we, we are really concerned about this, but we, we couldn't be bothered. Earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So, pardon my ignorance here. Um, is it's like Grand Admiral, like a completely separate position uh, to President? Like obviously they are, but like, can you have them both at the same time, or like, is it one or the other? Like, well, um, technically, um, the Grand Admiral is a cabinet position, like any other cabinet position, usually. So it's like Minister of Defense. Um, Minister of Defense, essentially. Yeah, it's just a different name for it. I don't think there legally has to be a Grand Admiral because the president gets to decide what kind of cabinet exists um, and what cab like the cabinet positions are like responsible for. Um, it's more of a tradition thing that we have... Um, all of these different ministries. Oh, one of the things that I did was merge radio and communications back together. That that was uh, there were two ministries that existed separately for a long, long time. But because of activity and a bunch of other things, it just wasn't viable to keep them separate anymore. That's something that TNP did as well. Yeah, radio got merged into comms again, and then comms got merged into culture. And at this point. I feel sorry for Feely because there's no possible way that he can do all of the responsibilities that has been just loaded onto his plate. Hmm. Yeah. But, you know, that's how it is. Yep. Yep. Um, anyway, so after your term as president of Europia, mm. I don't really know the story here. Like, how did you decide to come to TNP? Like, you're now Minister of Defense, but you you, you were brought in by, by Hold'em, like, mm -hmm. out of the blue, basically. How did that conversation go? Like, were you surprised by the offer? Um, well, did you know Hold'em previously? So Hold'em is somebody that's very much like, that I had to you know that i know as a friend but also as you know somebody that i've had to interact with politically a lot and it was like we had you know tnp and euro are super close in in many regards and because you know drn and is my baby and military gameplay is kind of the thing that even like during my presidency I focused a lot of my energy on um and i like realized that i kind of wanted to go back to doing just that because it gave me the two things that i enjoy the most in um in ns which is fa and 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 military things um and i know that holdem had been toying with the idea of um like finding solutions for the NPA for a while and at some point he just approached me being like do you see any any options for collaboration there it didn't like necessarily even have to be me um but I was like I kind of you know I kind of want to do that I kind of really want to do that and he was like all right sure <laughs> and uh so like i obviously like we had many many discussions about where he wanted the npa to go and how i would fit into that and i was obviously like w wary of just coming into a military that effectively i don't know the people i don't know the culture um and i didn't want to disrespect that 
and and Rom has been a huge help there because I was like I I, I showed up like in Rom's DMs I think a couple of days before I was officially announced being like Rom please help me <laughs> please um and he was like all right so here is everything you need to know <laughs> explain the entire <laughs> bureaucracy to me explain the people to me um which that's very helpful yeah yeah and a huge relief to you know have like a friendly face in in the npa but you know obviously you get a lot more familiar um with people as time goes on and i think gotten a pretty good grip on it now and it was very very weird in the beginning because like especially with the forums euros forums also you know same forum host so they look kind of similar but they're structured completely differently and yes it was so confusing <laughs> it was so confusing because the fucking npa forums are scattered over three or four sub forums right sub forum threads um where you have i don't <laughs> you have like you have to have the reports and the deployment thingies that are you know available to the public then you have the npa thing that's separate then you have the sign up thread which is also somewhere completely different and um, Box. If, ugh, it's it was <laughs> it was just like it, it was hard to just it, it sounds silly but like to navigate the basics was the hardest thing at the beginning because you know i'm, I'm used to doing military stuff but bureaucracy is very much and oof. What was your first impression of the North Pacific? Um, I don't remember. Because I I remember just like I you know as soon as I knew that I was gonna be here, I tried to get more familiar with people. Um, so I just started showing up in the Agora every now and then and I always had a good time like people here are very fun I, I very much appreciate the the atmosphere of like you know casual um goodbye Mark um of casual shit posting that oftentimes and like like casual banter that very much exists here um and I I don't know. It was it was certainly a positive impression, um, because so I, you mentioned yeah uh, feeling somewhat weird about coming into the NPA without like really knowing people and and trying to be respectful of the the culture that was there. But how how welcome did you feel by uh, people in the NPA? Um, was it just wrong? I felt very welcome. Like, like obviously, there were a couple of people who were a little like thought it was a little sus to just have me uh, pop in like that, which honestly very warranted and very fair. I completely understand. I would have felt the exact same way um, if that were to happen in you know my home region. Um, possibly would feel even stronger. Um, I was like pleasantly surprised that I didn't face any major backlash and that people were more like curious to see where this was going to go instead of just like outright um you know have negative opinions of essentially importing me um so I was I I just felt very welcome from the beginning and you you know getting to know the NPA people better certainly helped with that like you for example were a massive part of that and then um rom and also when it just came down to tech stuff with 9003 having chats with him also helped a lot and then just getting to know people through going on operations with them um was 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 very nice and the fact that i was met with a very different situation in terms of activity than I had expected it to be it was also helpful because you know I was I, I came here with sort of the promise of like the NPA it's been kind of very inactive and not 
great shape and then I you know pinged for an update that was like three hours away just to see how how many people would come and there were like five people showing up like with three hours notice and one ping which um for people not familiar with military numbers is very very good and like a lot better than the rn has been able to pull in like ages really so really all that i've had to do was provide people with the opportunity to do things so like give them the opportunity to become active by themselves in libcord or to join for trainings or join for d tags in the npa server um and join for liberations and you know just uh, like put the information out there that those are all things that are possible um and it's it's been going pretty well if i dare say so myself because we've had like i think close to 40 maybe potentially more operations th operations that we've been on since i i got into this position um and that's not like that that's due to the people who you know d themselves decided to become active which has just been a real real joy to be a part of because y you know i really do love military gameplay and it's always more fun if you can do it with a group of you know constant people that you like being around with and the npa is a very 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 nice place to be in um i'm glad you think so i'm just like are you a minister of defense now yeah what would you say your goals were setting off for this term so i divide that in into like actual goals for the npa and go goals for myself um so for the npa i wanted to have a stable you know military force that was able and um you know trained to attend all sorts of update operations with you know a big or like a solid you know ground force that attends updates regularly and then a larger force we can call on for more important operation like for example on the stargate liberation we had nine npa people huge shout out to rom who also did a lot of the outreach for that um and then for example for the operation last major we had seven seven people in libcord um attending uh you know a liberation that was also yeah, sorry i couldn't make it <laughs> oh well you were asleep and i'm glad that you were asleep sleep is very important but yeah, the, the Raiders gave up, so I consider this a win. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, I do too. Yeah. This is this is the hope. Yeah. So like, I kind of like we kind of are at that point that, you know, I thought this is like, this is like the ideal scenario that I thought maybe potentially hypothetically, we could get to. Um, but now that we're here. I very much want to see how much further we can push it, right? I'm I'm very huge on, you know, respecting people's boundaries and trying to make sure that people realize that NS can never be as important as their real life is and as their real life health and safety is. So to just create a space where people don't have to stress themselves out and, you know, feel pressure to attend updates while also creating enough initiatives for people to you know do so is is a very hard balance to to master but i'm trying um and i'm trying to make sure that people know that they can come to me when they have any sort of concerns and i'm trying to reach out to people in private and seeing like whether they want to attend updates or whether there are things that i'd like to learn and you know to just in encourage people um to 
continue the the upwards trend that we're on right now um for person like personal goals was mostly like returning to the thing that I love doing the most um and to also allow myself that space that I try to create for others because I put a lot of pressure on myself and I I very easily get into the mindset of you know no matter what I do it's not going to be good enough and there is always more that I could have done or more that I could have achieved and to sort of try and let go of that is is one of the big things that I'm I'm trying this term here yeah I think you um you mentioned that there might be some sort of new initiative that the NPA would be taking on in the possibly near future. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I can. Um, so, as we all know, Surrogate got raided again. And Holden and I have been thinking, because, you know, this is really, really no it situation. <laughs> it's a regular event. But it's not a good event, and it's really no long-term situation that we want to be in because it cripples us operationally, right, to always have to pile in Stargate to try and make sure that it doesn't get raided again just to see it get raided again when we dare to do something else, like an anti-fas- like anti-fascist operation, for example. <clears throat> so, so what's the plan? So the plan are the Star Guardians. The Star Guardians are going to be an initiative separate from like the normal NPA forces, which is just going to be people who are going to be recruited to pile in Stargate. Um, we're going to send regional telegrams. We're going to be active on the RMB um, and try and like get people to to move to Stargate. And so it's like auxiliary, except for Stargate, and just keep uh, a defense force there that isn't necessarily taking part in normal NPA operations, but it's, yep. that kind of serves as like a, a hard backdrop, a foundation that exactly. gives them the... Yeah, they're like the, the home front. Ability. The home front. Um, Our guardians. Yes. A good name. I like the name was the, the main thing um, of, of naming that what it is. Um... And, you know, to just have that off of our minds is going to be very, very good. Because we don't actually, like, considering TNP, WA, like, numbers, we need, like, like 1% of that. We need 1% of, if, if of, of, yeah. of TNP's endos to move to Stargate. And that'll just never be a problem again. Right. Yes, exactly. Um, okay, so you're very much still active in Europia. Just because you're Minister of Defense here in the North Pacific doesn't mean that you've left your sort of main region behind, right? Mm. Um, but what are your plans here in the North Pacific? Like, how long do you plan on sticking around? Do you think you'll be Minister of Defense again for another term after this? Like, it, what are your thoughts? Oh, well, right now I'd like to be if people will have me. I don't. Actu- oh, but I'm not the one making the decision. <laughs> I, I don't actually have any long term plans for Team P at the moment. That was like not my motivation for getting involved here. Um, like I said, my motivation was just like for once in my life doing the thing that I actually want to be doing and then having the opportunity to do so was obviously like God given or told him given in that case. Um, <laughs> and Hold him is It is known. <laughs> Hold him is our God Emperor and he's never going to leave the TNP delegacy ever. <laughs> I think the SC would have something to say about this. He's God, Fiji. We can't do anything about it. It doesn't matter whether the AC says something about it or not. <laughs> no, um, I'm kidding, of course. Yeah, no, no long-term plans. I like doing military stuff. I like doing FA, and that's that's the vibes right now. Um, you know. Would I'm... you consider like I, I know that your your main focus, right, is is military stuff. But would mm-hmm. you ever like 
consider becoming active in other aspects of TNP life, like culture and radio, where your skills would be sorely appreciated? I mean, yeah, for sure. I, like I said, I love doing radio. I also like doing culture. It's a matter of time more than it is a matter of willingness because my school life is very, very demanding. For example, I spent like every single day from like January 8th to January 31st in school. I remember that, the exams. Yeah, the exams. And, you know, there were two days where I didn't go because one day I was sick and the other day I just c could not anymore. So like kind of finding the balance between at some point maybe sleeping going to school um then making npa go new and then also on top of that organizing cultural things is huh. i get it it's, it can be a lot yeah you've got to have some leniency with yourself right real life is always going to be more important than the nation states and you have to keep a balance, right? Yep. But um, I know that Maui has questions, apparently. And I'm sure other people in the audience do as well. So at this point, I'd kind of like to open it up to them um, to ask any questions that they have. And I figured the way I'll do this is to just sort of... Well, I was going to like moderate the questions, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose you can too. You can be a, a good judge of what you want to answer. Um, but just make sure that you read the question first and like who's asking it yep. so that future listeners know what's going on without being really really confused yes uh i'm genuinely generally willing to answer any and all questions um so and if uh you don't feel comfortable asking the question in public you can also just dm me and i can make it an anonymous question uh, so long as it is uh, sort of generally on topic and or appropriate. Yes. So we'll just sort of wait around then until someone has a question. Or in the meantime, maybe I'll just keep asking my own. Yeah, I mean, you can. Uh, all right. So uh, the, the North Pacific Army is always looking for more soldiers, right? Mm -hmm. Aside from the Star Guardian program to sort of take to to give the NPAers who are you know serving every day a, a little bit of relief from having to rescue Stargate occasionally. Do you have any ideas for how sort of recruitment for the main NPA force could be done better? Um. So one thing that I want to try and look into is like going to the RMB more because that's you know where a lot of TNP is happening. Like a lot of like essentially all of the on-site TNP is happening um and I'd like to get f more familiar with the culture there and then see if there are people who'd be interested in that Holdem and I discussed a couple of things like for example the possibility of me um reaching or like me and my actually I have a deputy I have a deputy I'm gonna make a forum post about that later but you get a juicy deputy reveal um so this person has become incredibly active over the last couple of weeks and has proven themselves to be um, very, very reliable and very active and just generally pretty awesome. Um, and they were very on board with all of the ideas that I had for them to do. So it's deputy time. Comfed. Yay. I'm glad. Me too. I'm glad you've made that decision. That's a, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, um Ed is yeah he's he's very active he's also more rel reliably on the site than i am <laughs> so good choice good choice all right um that's great <laughs> yeah uh maui has a question uh can you talk about your involvement in organizing events like ucr con and nsge i it comes down to doing things for people again right because that's the whole thing of culture is making sure that people have a good time and i thrive when people are having a good time um 
especially when I was the one to, you know, cause them to have that good time. Um, so I, I started at NS as a culture person, and while I am not mainly in culture anymore, having the ability to, you know, be involved in the bigger festivals has, like, always been one of my highlights, um, b- because it, it is a lot of fun to just organize something as a team and then you know with things like NSGE and UCRCon people are just always so excited to get to like get the possibility to meet people from other regions and to have that sort of exchange and make that possible has been pretty awesome and I'm glad that I got the chance to do that I'm like so I've organized the Spring Beach Bash once. I, One thing that I've found myself quite, uh, you know, enjoying doing was organizing scavenger hunts. Um, I've done that twice now, or or thrice, several times. No, three times. Once for Mouse Bumple's Ovation, then for the Spring Beach Bash, and then for my first ever, like, interregional event that I organized, which was the... Festival of Hiraef, I think is how it's pronounced, which is still one of my favorite events that I've ever, you know, done. Um, that was when I was Tishik for the first or the second time. I think maybe the second time. Um, and it was like, you know, um, planning scavenger hunts is a lot of work. Like, you put an hour of work into something that will take people a minute to solve so it was just like getting everything ready and then for the first one we had I think legitimately a 10 hour planning session where we just sat in a VC and figured everything out Um, and that's the kind of thing that I enjoy it's like the very niche things that are like bring a couple of people joy and that's yeah good 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 vibes as as Maui says um also very when nice. you're um when you're planning like a a, a major mm-hmm. festival like that um so obviously takes a huge amount of work and commitment like you're talking about have you ever experienced the sort of like fickle nature of it though where like you can put in a huge amount of work and like, sure, a couple people might really enjoy it uh, for like a minute, right? But sometimes no one shows up at all, right? And your work feels wasted. Has that happened to you? And how do you deal with that? Actually, I have made a radio show, an IRC radio show about that exact topic, um, like culture in nation states. Um, I think that was with well, I even may have listened to it. <laughs> that was with, I don't even quite remember. That was with Sarah, I think GK, and Sammy. Um, no, actually, oh. people listened to it, which was nice. But um, I've I've held very many culture jobs over the over the times. So I was steward of internal affairs in the Serena Star System, which has since stopped existing. But I was, you know, in charge of. In internal affairs was their name for culture um so i i did culture there f- for like six months and i'd organize these quizzes quizzes you know that would take um hours upon hours to you know search and research for um because i'd have these i, I made these theme weeks that people genuine generally seem to enjoy but like um with the quizzes it was always like hit or miss like Either 10 people would show up and have a blast or nobody would. And it was just (laughs) very, very unreliable and very frustrating after a time because, you know, you put so much effort into it just for nobody to show up. And in Euro, for example, like culture is the ministry that gets shut on the most because people want to be entertained and then one thing doesn't happen exactly the way they wanted to or you know you played golf with your friends instead of i don't know 
um, d- bubble league, and it's it's very very hard to please everyone in culture. And people complain that you know the same things get done over and over and over again, but also nobody's bringing new ideas to the table. So, like, what are you supposed to do? Um, so yeah, it can be very, very frustrating. Uh, which is partially why it's not my main occupation anymore. But so I I asked a lot about uh your background in Karasidi. I asked about Europia because. It was my understanding, anyway, that you spent the majority, at least, of your time in the last three years on nation states in in those two regions. Mm-hmm. But you just mentioned Theranus, uh Darkism, and I think you were also like Cosmo in Edelhus. Like, e- how many different regions are you citizen in now? And now? like, that, how has that changed over time? Like, what was the map? <laughs> you know that you were and i i i think well right now i'm only a citizen of tnp and euro and technically i'm in a startup region of of one of my friends but that's pretty dormant and is not currently being built that's a future project so really it's just tnp and euro was not always this way i think the most that I held was like six or seven citizenships at the same time. Oh wow! Yeah, six. this is how very. How do you deal with that? How do you manage it? There's not enough time in the day, Icarus. <laughs> there is when there's COVID. Uh, I guess. I guess. I guess. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. You know, like I said, the the beginning for me was just like talking to people and getting to know people, which is still very much what I'm doing. For the record, this is. To anybody who's interested in getting involved in foreign affairs, making friends is the way to do it. And getting to know people from other places is the way that you sort of, like, get more involved in those circles. It's all social contacts and, oh, so, so many VCs. I've always wanted to be more aware of, like, FA. Mm -hmm. And... I, I do that as well, right? Like making friends is the way to do it. Yeah. Um, like how interregional contacts are made and why they matter. And I mean, all of that. But like for me anyway, it's like a very slow process. And I really mm-hmm. don't understand how FA ministers can sort of juggle like the very real friendships that are made with like the decade long before your time history that like needs to be considered that's like the in character and out of character divide that you know you need to always be very careful with because yes you you make actual real friends but that doesn't stop them from fucking you over in character and that doesn't stop you from fucking them over in in character um, so there is a very d- big difference between in-character and out-of-character friendships that sometimes, unfortunately, can get muddy. And there are certain circles that I'm not going to mention that are more prone to that. And, you know, being aware of that is something that's also a very big learning curve when you get more involved in the, the whole FA shenanigans because yeah in character and like out of character friendship has very little to do with the in character happenings and it's good that it's that way because otherwise things just get very very complicated yeah so yeah what what were the other regions then that you were in it was it was Edelhus it was Res Publica Oh, how many other about Respublica? Um, Respublica, the Serena yeah, Star I did my system. <laughs> I was in Refugia. That was the most recent one that I now no longer in. I was in Thacia for a while, but I only joined Thacia because you know the Iran was dead, and I wanted to do military stuff, and that was obviously exactly the time that the empirical army decided to also go inactive 
so I got rid of that again. I I was a citizen of Entropy before Ooh. Cormac, I think. And then Cormac came to power and I was not involved there anymore. So I I yeeted that. Where else was I? I very much just followed my social circle at the time. I you was go in, where there's kids. Yeah, I would I was in Milktopia, which was a essentially a friends region that we had with some of some of my oldest NS friends. I was in NSUK when that wasn't problematic, you know? Yes. Yeah. Um I, need to cover that. I was obviously in Care City. Du, 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 du. Is there more? I mean at this point, I maybe like <laughs> you, you found, like several names that I I did a lot of research for this interview. I I did not realize. And I maybe should have asked about them more, but I didn't know. Um Yeah, I think that's it. You were never in uh, Brotherhood of Mouse by oh, any chance? Oh, no, no, no. No. Um I was, I was never in any Raider region, I don't think. I've noticed throughout a number of your avatars uh that you uh like penguins a lot what uh makes you so fond of them what makes you so fond of penguins um this started with one particular penguin picture that i'm sure i have somewhere but that i'm entirely too lazy to find so i'm gonna try and google it and if i don't find it you're not gonna see it but it was okay. this super grumpy penguin that looked like baby penguin that looked extremely derpy and I was like yes this is me <laughs> and so before then I was baby Yoda like I I had a baby Yoda profile picture and I didn't plan on going full penguin it just kind of stuck so it it was it was just like baby penguins are adorable I have I have a a YouTube playlist of silly penguin videos that are very good to watch when you're feeling down. Feeling down, yeah. Maui asks if there are other baby Yoda people in nation states that you know of. Um, I think there is one. They're literally just called Baby Yoda. Uh, yeah, but I think at that time I was the only Baby Yoda I know of. Or that I knew. I know there were several penguins. A couple of, like in the beginning, a couple of people would confuse me with Zizu from TBH. Um, but they usually went with like the more drawn, cutesy things. And I actually had like pictures of penguins as my profile picture most of the time. I branched off into a little bo bit more like Pinterest artsy thingies for a while, but. Then Vor, who is a very, very dear friend of mine, um, got me as their secret Santa. And they got one of their friends to draw the picture. That's my current profile picture. I had pink hair at that point, which is why the hair of the penguin is pink. <laughs> and I, I didn't know that. That's quite kind of him. It is incredibly kind of him. It genuinely made me so happy because, you know, I like, I love drawing and I love drawing, drawing things for other people, but not very many people draw things for me, which like, I don't expect them to, but to, you know, have somebody think of that, 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 that just made me very happy. Yeah. So even though I had kind of grown out of my penguin phase after like, yeah, even yeah, I, I very happily went back when I received this very awesome gift. Can you do the Baby Yoda dance? Uh, do you know the one I'm referring to? I think I, think I know, but I'm, I, I'm not very Baby Yoda-like um, IRL, so I think it just looks very silly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not very tiny and cute. Unlike Baby Yoda, who's very tiny and cute. 
All right. So unless there's any more uh, questions, I think we should wrap up the show so that we respect people's time. And uh, yeah, so thanks everybody for coming. Um, thank you for uh, making this happen, Feely. And uh, thank you, Icarus, for doing this with me. This is great. I had a lot of fun. Thank you for all of the questions and for hosting this.